Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. And welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, a John Carpenter podcast where we discuss all things Carpenter all the time. With me, as usual, are my co-hosts, Julia. What up? And Noel. Hello. And joining us is a very special guest, Melissa Kirscher. Hello. Melissa, tell us about yourself. Well, I'm a podcaster at uh, Real Education and A Real Education Noir and at Xanadu Cinema Pleasure Dome. I also used to color and letter comic books, and I occasionally blog. I do photography, yada, yada, yada. So I'm around. And he hosts these wonderful movie nights that I'm delighted to have been invited to. <laughs> and I believe the next one is tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Right now we're going through the films of Nicolas Cage. All of them. Excellent. And we have previously lamented that Nicolas Cage and John Carpenter have never made a movie together. I know. There's still time. Do another sequel to Vampires. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a vampire! I'm a vampire! <laughs> Bring back Bon Jovi. James Woods won't come back. Just replace him with Cage. Yeah. I'd watch that. I could get behind that. So, since this is your first time guesting on the show, would you like to just tell us what's your history with and overall impression of John Carpenter? Oh, I've been a longtime fan of John Carpenter. I started watching his movies back in the 80s, you know, back in the day. The Thing is one of my favorite films of all time. It's a very infectious movie. It, it is. It is. And I oh, adore it. <laughs> <laughs> there was one year at Convergence where I led a panel called The John Carpenter Intervention, where we literally charted all of his movies and how good they were versus when he made them and decided it was time to intervene. That was a very fun experience. I love John Carpenter. I do lament some of his later films, but I still think he should be celebrated as a filmmaker. You're here. And I have really enjoyed some of his recent works, uh, especially with Masters of Horror and things like that. It was nice to see him come back. It's a shame we aren't really going to get any more films from him, what with being blind. Well, you know, Kurosawa did it. John Carpenter should be able to. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Carpenter could just do a whole bunch of oil paintings. Yes. <laughs> Bring Tommy Lee Wallace in to co-direct with him. <laughs> <laughs> this could work. This could work, Noel. We have a plan. <laughs> Tommy Lee Wallace, your calling has come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm sure we can find some collaborators to work with him. I mean, oh, yeah. he's friends with Drew McQueenie, and McQueenie has some pals. This is the new mission statement of Masters of Carpentry. Let's get another one made. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <sighs> we are here to discuss Prince of Darkness. And why don't we just go around real quick to establish what is like our prior history with this movie. Alex and Julia? Zero. I didn't even know the plot until I watched it. I purposely oh. didn't look it up. I've heard of it. People mention it. I forget about it all the time. I knew Alice Cooper was involved. And there is a snippet of the movie that is sampled in one of my favorite albums, Introducing by DJ Shadow. They use the uh, one nine 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 part, but that's it. Which is Carpenter's own voice. Oh, I had a feeling. I'm like, I bet it's him. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, anything? Well, I was disappointed when it wasn't the movie that I thought it was, which was a documentary about Apocalypse Now. It turns out it was not that oh. movie. It's a different one. Oh, oh, that's a very different film. It's a very good film. <laughs> John Carpenter's Hearts of Darkness. <laughs> Hearts of Darkness is amazing. Dear listeners, if you have not seen Hearts of Darkness, amazing film. Very different from this one. Yeah, it wasn't that. It was something else. <laughs> it would just be cool to believe that Prince of Darkness was this little thing that was filmed during the making of another film. What if these two films were the same film? Could you imagine mashing them together? <laughs> oh my God. That trailer would be fun to make. That was literally my history. Was <laughs> I thought it was a certain movie and it wasn't. Ah. <laughs> there you go. So you almost had seen another John Carpenter movie before now. I was like, oh yeah, it's that thing. I've heard of that. That's going to be really good. And then it started. I'm like, I don't think this is what that, who was that guy with the mustache? I don't know. These are definite lines. <laughs> Like, this has nothing to do with what I thought it was going to be about. Just intercut like, right. shenanigans on the set of Apocalypse <laughs> Now with Alice Cooper just glaring at him. <laughs> <laughs> 
By the way, the guy with the mustache is Jameson Parker, who was on Simon and Simon as Simon. As the one without a mustache. (laughs) Ironically. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So, Melissa, what's your history with this movie? Oh, I first saw Prince of Darkness, oh, around 1993, 1994 or so. And I remember being of kind of two minds about the movie. It's like, God, this is kind of a trashy movie. (laughs) is one of them. And the other one is, it's strangely effective in spite of itself. And I kind of have the same opinion. The thing that struck me when I first watched it was that it's like, oh God, the characters aren't acting like human beings at all. And it's kind of dumb in a lot of ways, but the parts that work really work. And at the end, the movie was strangely effective. Like I was kind of freaked out that night. It had a lingering effect on me, and uh, I didn't revisit it for many, many years. In fact, the next time I watched it was this evening, (laughs) right before this podcast. So it was fun to revisit after all this time. Same here. There were so many things where I like remembered parts of this movie, but I just didn't remember how they all put together until I watched it here. I watched it in the 90s, probably mid to late 90s, when I was first getting into Carpenter. Mm -hmm. The local Suncoast actually had a uh, VHS two-pack where you could get this and they live together. (laughs) Yes. It was one of those films that I didn't really have any particular feeling for, but there were things that just kind of stuck with me. I think I probably saw it two times back then, and this is the first time I've seen it since the late 90s. Mm -hmm. So let's just move into a little history about the film. After the three unfortunate box office strikes of The Thing, Starman, and Big Trouble in Little China, studios were no longer interested in working with John Carpenter, and he was more than happy to move away from them for a while. Before we move on, I did poke around and I found some of the other films from the 80s that Carpenter was in talks to direct before he had the falling out. We have Fatal Attraction, (laughs) Armed and Dangerous, The Golden Child, (laughs) Inner Space, Thelma and Louise, (laughs) and Tombstone. Oh, wow. I would watch that. I'd watch the John Carpenter tombstone in a heartbeat. Still with Kurt Russell. Yes. That'd be good. Yes. Yes. I want to live in that parallel universe. (laughs) I want to go through the mirror and find my way into that parallel universe. And I did actually find a little interview snippet where Carpenter talks about why he never made a Western. Mm -hmm. It almost happened a few times, but he always ultimately passed because he was afraid he would embarrass himself because he loves Westerns so much. And I'm like, no, just, just make one. <laughs> just give it a shot. See how it goes. It's fine. We love you. Throw some demons in there. Yeah. <laughs> Donald Pleasance. Yeah. John Carpenter doing a Western with Donald Pleasance as a town undertaker. Donald Pleasance <laughs> as every character, except for the one played by Kurt Russell. <laughs> Get Adrian Barbeau in there. Have her be the bounty hunter that's after Kurt Russell. Yes. This is starting to sound like that new Tarantino film. Yes. <laughs> I think we're actually putting together a John Carpenter Western. <laughs> I will have to think about this more later. <laughs> so this brings us to executive producers Andre Blay and Shep Gordon. Back in the 60s, Blay was one of the pioneers of 8-track tapes and video duplication, and a venture he created called the Video Club of America was what gave birth to video rental outlets as a whole. The licensing this provided proved so beneficial to the industry that his company was bought by Fox, and Blay was made the CEO of 20th Century Fox Video. He then shifted over to Embassy Home Entertainment, running that company until it was sold in 1986. He then teamed with Shep Gordon, a famed talent agent for actors and musicians and a best friend of the Dalai Lama. (laughs) Not joking. They meet once every other year, to this day. Sweet! To form the indie company Alive Films. With Carpenter on the ropes, they offered him a two-picture deal where he would have complete carte blanche to do whatever he wanted, as long as he brought the film in on time and on a budget of just $3 million. And the two pictures this produced were Prince of Darkness and They Live. (laughs) Which is why we're having you on for both of those, because there's this great tie between them. (laughs) (laughs) You wouldn't know it just by looking at them, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Following both, Alive then offered the same deal to Wes Craven, which resulted in Shocker and the People Under the Stairs. And other Alive films include A Time of Destiny, Grand Isle, and Vanilla Ice is Cool as Ice. (laughs) It's a classic. And then the company folded. I love Cool as Ice so much. (laughs) I don't feel guilty about that whatsoever. I just do. I still haven't seen it. Oh my god, it's glorious in its horribleness, and I love it. (laughs) So Blay and Gordon will then also go on to executive produce Carpenter's Village of the Damned, and Gordon was also the music agent of Alice Cooper, which is the reason that musician ended up in this movie. And it was literally because they had him come and visit the set for a day, 
And John, just on the spur of the moment, was like, hey, can I sticky in a few scenes? <laughs> and suddenly he's in a whole bunch of them. Yeah, those were all just shot in a day. And he just happened to have the bicycle rig. We'll talk about that scene. I have seen Alice Cooper perform, and I know the bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> So Prince of Darkness was directed by John, who also wrote the film under the pseudonym Martin Quatermass, a tip of the hat to the lead of Nigel Neal's Quatermass franchise. We brought up Nigel Neal in our Halloween 3 episode, and Melissa, you've done a Xanadu episode going through all the Quatermass films. Oh, yes. That was a lot of fun. And it was a very long episode. Yes. <laughs> Which you can find at, is it XanaduCinema.com? XanaduCinema.com. Yes. It should be said that Nigel Neal was not happy with that. No. Because he thought it created some confusion. And also he was still not fond of Carpenter after the whole Halloween 3 experience. Nigel Neal also got kind of cranky in his later years. He went the Alan Moore route. Oh yes, he really did. Without the mysticism. From like 1978 <laughs> on, Nigel Neal was a really cranky guy. Yeah. Carpenter also did the score for the film, his seventh in collaboration with Alan Howarth. This is the sixth Carpenter film produced by Larry Franco, who again serves as first assistant director. We mentioned in our Big Trouble in Little China episode that Carpenter's collaboration with Dean Cundey had come to an end, his cinematographer. This is Carpenter's first film with Gary Kibbe, who, with one exception, will go on to shoot all of Carpenter's remaining films up through Ghosts of Mars. Kibbe first worked with Carpenter as a cameraman under Cundey on Halloween 2 and Big Trouble in Little China. Prince of Darkness was his first film as director of photography, and while he's done quite a bit of second unit photography over the years, the only other films he DP'd outside of Carpenter are Robocop 3... And Double Dragon. <laughs> so it definitely did not have the career path of Dean Cundy. No, no. So this is the fifth and final Carpenter film with actor Donald Pleasance, and his first with Peter Jason, the guy who kind of looks like Meatloaf. Oh yeah, that guy. Who will become a major Carpenter regular with additional appearances in They Live, Body Bags, In the Mouth of Madness, Village of the Damned, Escape from L.A., and Ghosts of Mars. And him and Carpenter are huge buddies, and they did the commentary together on the DVD. It's great. Mm -hmm. This is the third Carpenter film on which Sandy King serves as a script supervisor, and this is three years before she and John Carpenter marry. Fun bonus credit, the costumes were done by Mark Peterson, who also did a little film called Xanadu. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! And is currently working on a little film called The Hunger Games Mockingjay. That's quite a career trajectory. Yes. And our last credit, this is the 10th John Carpenter film for Boom Operator Joe Brennan. So in terms of the release, while the film was produced independently, it was distributed by Universal, which put Carpenter in an odd position after the trouble he had had with the studio over Halloween's 2 and 3 and The Thing. It came out on October 23rd, 1987 and pulled a total domestic gross of just over $14 million. It opened number two behind Fatal Attraction, the film Carpenter was in talks to direct, which was in its sixth week of release and was still number one. <laughs> well, I remember when it came out, Fatal Attraction was a juggernaut. Yeah. It was huge. So by its second week, Prince of Darkness dropped to number five, then number 14, and by its fourth week, The Running Man came out and Prince of Darkness was no longer in the top 20. <laughs> 1987 was a huge movie year. Yeah. The number of things that came out that year that are just huge impacts on popular culture, the lineup's astounding. I saw Prince of Darkness was running opposite Princess Bride. Yeah. Which was ahead of it and then behind it and then ahead of it. Mm-hmm. Like every other week, something amazing came out in 1987. It was a really great year to be a movie nerd. Anything anyone else wants to add before we jump into the synopsis? Nope. Because this was an interesting film to synopsize. <laughs> <laughs> a priest is called in when an elderly colleague passes, having left behind a chest containing a key and a diary describing the Brotherhood of Sleep. In the seal of vault of a Los Angeles church, he finds a cross-laden chamber containing an ancient vial of swirling green liquid and a Bible where alternative passages have been written over one another over the course of 2,000 years. Unsure what to make of it all, he calls in Howard Barak, a theoretical physics professor at a nearby university with whom he once appeared in a series of debates between religion and science. Barak is given free reign to examine the vial, bringing in a small army of science students to explore it from every angle. As they make their tests and translate the Bible, they gradually put together that God, who is present in every particle of matter, has a counterpart anti-God, who exists in antimatter particles in a dimension mirroring our own. Anti-God's son, Satan, was sealed in the vial 7 million years ago, which was dug up in a Middle Eastern desert 2,000 years ago. Jesus then came down from the stars to warn us not to open the container, among many other Jesusly lessons, and when he was killed, the church locked the vial away under the guard of the Brotherhood of Sleep. 
As the investigation plays out, odd phenomena occurs. There's a conjunction of moon and sun in the sky, insects begin swarming in strange spots, objects move on their own, and a cluster of mentally vulnerable homeless people begin surrounding the building and soon begin killing off anyone who strays outside its walls. It also turns out that water has begun leaking from the vial, albeit upwards to where it's pooled on the ceiling. A gout of the water sprays down the throat of an unfortunate student, and she begins preying on her peers, spraying one after another into disturbing zombies. On top of this, everyone begins having a shared dream of a video image beamed from the future, warning of a shadowy figure emerging from the church. One student, Kelly, bumped her arm earlier, and the bruise has gradually formed into the brand of an inverted cross. She has an entire pool of the possessed water pour into her, causing her body to rapidly deteriorate as she's taken over by the spirit of Satan. Using a mirror, she reaches in in an attempt to pull her father to our world, but fellow student Catherine tackles her, sending both into the mirror before it shattered, leaving them sealed in an antimatter darkness. This devastates Brian, who recently began a relationship with Catherine, and his video dreams of the future have now replaced the dark figure with that of Catherine emerging from the church. The final shot is of Brian, tentatively reaching out to the glass of a mirror before we cut to black. Most of that was just backstory. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> It's a very intriguing setup. The combination of religion and science, you know, oh, yeah. just mashing those things together has always been a very interesting angle. And I remember hearing Carpenter talk about writing it. He was saying that a lot of the contemporary horror films that were coming out at the time were just all religious based. And he was very interested in bringing science into it, you know, very much like the Quatermass films. Quatermass, Legend of Hell House. Yeah, good stuff. This definitely reflects that. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of Quatermass in this, in fact. I mean, when you look at Lisa Blount, who plays Catherine, she looks like Shelly... Oh, Shelly... What's her name? Just like what's her name from Quatermass in the pit. Barbara Shelly. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, even the hairstyle is very similar. Kind of that reddish brown with the bob sort of haircut. Oh, yeah. Let's just go around real quick. Alex, do you recommend this movie? I don't know. <laughs> Normally, I don't like movies like this where it's like a horror film, but usually involves the devil as the villain where there's like no rules, chaotic, like your, you know, event horizons and your hell raisers. They just usually don't work for me in that capacity. So I'm kind of prejudiced. But this is effective in what it's doing. It did frighten me, which a lot of Carpenter films haven't done because even the thing is like a pair of comfy socks that I put on. I just, I like it so much <laughs> that it doesn't really have that gut reaction. Whereas this one really made me uneasy and genuinely frightened me a couple times. And there are really innovative shots and scenes and just it's brimming with great ideas. And like you said, from the scientific angle towards these apocalyptic religious movies, the fact that they bring in all these scientists, maybe too many scientists, because the <laughs> no one really has a good character. And that's probably because there's 400 people in this movie, in this one room. Mm -hmm. But it does work in a lot of aspects. And I really appreciate it on those levels. So I'm going to think about that. <laughs> Julia, do you recommend the movie? I liked it. <laughs> Which is strange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you usually don't like the horror ones. No, I don't like that sort of thing. But I, I really liked it. I thought it was really scary. <laughs> Alex was a little chatty for the last half an hour. And I was just on, like, talk shut down. I was like, I'm watching the movie. <laughs> Yeah, there are certain points where I'm just like, come on, get on with it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no, I'm enjoying the tension. It's good. It's good. It did not make a lick of sense. But for some reason, won my heartstrings. There you go. <laughs> and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I would definitely recommend it. And I think I will watch it again myself in the not too distant future. Melissa, do you recommend the movie? Oh, I definitely do. I think it's definitely worth a watch. The parts that don't work do not override the parts that do, I think. There are definitely aspects where it's like, oh, come on, you know, talking back to the characters. It's like, okay, you dolt, don't do that. You should know better. The characters aren't very well developed, and there's way too many of them. I mean, if I had a crack at editing the script, I'd probably put half as many characters in it and mm -hmm. give them all more time to develop, and then you might actually care what happens to them. But yeah, the stuff that does work, the conceptual stuff, the bits about the mirrors, the transmission through dreams, the mysterious vial in the basement, the church that is somehow filled with candles. Who's taking care of those candles? What's their <laughs> candle budget? I don't know. But it does kind of work. It's kind of fascinating. It's kind of like the Filene's basement of a film. You know, you kind of have to dig through the stuff that's like, oh, this is kind of trashy. But oh, look at that down there. That's interesting. I'll take that home with me. 
So yeah, I think it's definitely worth a visit. Have a look. I tentatively recommend it too. I think it's a film where it has a lot of intriguing parts that don't really all come together, but it is still very effectively made. Mm -hmm. The characters are thin, but they're not unwatchable. I think the actors do a lot of really great stuff with them. The concept is very interesting, even though it doesn't always go anywhere. A lot of the horror scenes are really nicely suspensefully made and creepy, and it has this great atmosphere and this mood to it, this whole looming dread of the apocalypse against this very small, intimate setting. It's not one of Carpenter's strongest movies. It's not one of his smartest movies. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It feels like a big collection of stuff that's just been thrown together, but he still delivered it in a very effective way. And I, I would say, yeah, it's at least worth a watch. I don't think it's going to be like a classic that everyone needs to watch over and over again, but it's worth a watch. Mm -hmm. I did find it remarkable, since I hadn't seen this movie in oh, probably 20 years, how much I remembered of it. Same here. Not the guy with the mustache, but I remembered everything else. Oh, I remember the guy with the mustache, because that's Simon and Simon. Well, Simon. See, I never watched Simon and Simon. <laughs> but, you know, I remember the dream. I remember the closing scene with that one last jump shot before that lovely tentative scene of him reaching towards the mirror. Mm -hmm. I remember the big vial of green stuff and the really awkward sexist comments and... <laughs> By the way, why did Mustache a guy, how did those two get together? I mean, seriously, there was no chemistry. There was no development of that relationship. There was no reason for those two to be in bed together at all, or even talking to each other. I mean, like after that first sexist comment, she should have been like, bye, gone. <laughs> and that should have been it. I mean, I think the ending would have been more effective had they been a couple. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the characters in this movie just feel very underdeveloped and underthought. Yeah. I mean, I think the most interesting is actually Walter, but he doesn't get to do anything. Mm hmm Just because he's a gay Asian man in a time when you usually didn't see that representation in a movie. Oh, yeah. And, you know, actually, I like Donald Pleasance because I always like Donald Pleasance. Donald Pleasance and Victor Wong. Yeah. Those two are the most captivating part of the movie. Maybe if it was just the two of them in the church figuring this out, that would be yeah. awesome. <laughs> I read the script. It was like reading the script for Halloween 2, where it's just so much time is spent in the hospital with a whole group of underdeveloped characters that you can't tell apart. Mm -hmm. And this one, I thought the actors brought some in. Like, the actors all brought in the whole zombie thing of creepy laughing and sobbing and all that stuff. That was all made up on set by the actors. Which is interesting. Although that's one of the parts that doesn't work for me, because I feel like if there should be the anonymous horde kind of creeping yeah. you out, they should be of one mind and they should all be behaving the same way. Which I think is one of the problems overall that I see with the movie. Like the movie sets up its internal rules and then breaks them. I don't even think it really sets up rules. I think it just sets up a goal for the villain. Yeah, you might be right. But then, yeah, it's like, as Alex said, it's kind of one of those supernatural anything. It's a very much... This film reminds me most of the Argento film Suspiria and Inferno mm -hmm. and the Fulci film The Beyond. Yeah. Especially because in The Beyond, in the last third, everyone's suddenly coming back to zombies while this whole apocalyptic thing is happening. It reminds me of like a 12-year-old sitting in class writing a horror story. It's like, that would be scary, and that would be scary too. Satan is the son of anti-God. Yeah! <laughs> and that would be scary too. We'll just put them all together in the same story. Not caring whether they relate to each other at all. Yeah. I thought the idea of it was genuinely scary. Yeah. Like, I know it was oh, yeah. really based in nothingness. I think also because they did bring the science and they were testing all the stuff and all like that. I think I just think devil stuff is scary, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that stuff I did find effective. I think it's my Roman Catholic upbringing. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. When it was all still based on, like, actual Catholicism and stuff. Like the very idea that this vault had been in there forever and the Roman Catholic Church and the Vatican didn't even know about it and that it contained this thing and it was up to this one guy to look after it. Nope, not going to happen. The candle budget alone, as discussed, astronomical. That would have gotten back mm -hmm. to someone. <laughs> I was wondering about why all the candles were lit, too. I did catch the line where they said he went in there every day. He did okay. go in there every day. But honestly, tapers, guys. But still, how many matches is he going through? But let's think about this. Get some <laughs> pillars down there. There's no reason why you can't use electrical light. Also, they brought their own spotlights. It works. Get a generator. <laughs> Come on, it's a fire hazard. <laughs> it's like a temple in Tomb Raider. You should get those little LED tea lights, the little electrical tea lights. Yeah, they had them. They brought yeah. them down with them. Take a little hydroelectric generator, hook it up to the vial. <laughs> Christmas lights, guys. Christmas lights. It's Satan-powered lights. <laughs> he could do it. 
<laughs> yeah. It's simple, but I love the whole idea. It's Satan wants to get free from a vial so he can free anti-God to our world and cause the arm again. That's all good and effective, and I actually like how that leads to all the zombie horror. But my problem with the science angle, mm -hmm. and I love the idea of the science angle because I love the Quatermass films, is that they then never do anything with the science. Oh, I know. No. The science is just literally there to translate the book and give us all the backstory when they could have just read the book. Mm -hmm. What I loved about the Quatermass is where it's science finding itself face to face with some force that they're struggling to understand, and yet they still figure out how to overcome it through science. Mm -hmm. And not bricks and two by fours. Yeah. Right. I don't know. I mean, like, I don't know what a Craig or Mackey is, but like the, <laughs> the, the fact that they were all scientists fighting something of a deeply religious backstory was interesting because normally it's a bunch of like two old priests get together that you have to know all this stuff about the Bible. You have to have faith in order to destroy it. But you don't. You actually just need science to understand it and then hit it with a two by four. <laughs> <laughs> no religion or church going necessary. I think what Noel wanted to see was like a Home Alone situation where they actually do science things to defeat this creature since they have this whole <laughs> lab set up. Well, maybe not like the end of Nightmare on Elm Street where she's literally home aloning it. But <laughs> <laughs> well, well, maybe the angle is that the two by four is that's impact. That's physics. There you go. There's your science. There you go. Well, I mean, like the end of Greater Mass in the Pit, <laughs> find a big piece of iron to channel the energy through. Yeah, but they justified that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a big sponge for all that green jello. <laughs> Somehow yeah. scientifically magnetized Alice Cooper's bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> the politically correctly titled Street Schizo, I believe his character's nice. name was. I just think it was the idea of bringing a bunch of people together that their first conclusion would not be, you know what, I think this is the devil, guys. Yeah. yeah. And it would be a bunch of non-believers. It would be a bunch of people who would just be like, what? <laughs> it's a bunch of caca. It's got to be something else. I love that there are characters who are conflicted in terms of there's the breakdown between those who believe, those who don't believe. But then they don't really follow through on that even to make character studies of any of these people when faced with this. Right. It's just kind of lightly there, but then it's glossed over. I basically separated the characters between those who walked downstairs and those who stayed upstairs. <laughs> How about the one guy who walked upstairs while dragging a chair and singing Amazing Grace? That guy was bringing it. His zombie game was next level. I appreciate it. I that. really he did. loved, loved, loved his performance. Yeah, it was He was unsettling. genuinely terrifying. And I felt for him. Yeah. He was an empathetic horror. Absolutely. I know nothing about that guy. No. I don't know what his backstory is. I don't remember his name. But as soon as he started walking up the stairs with the chair, I'm like, oh, my God, he's fighting it. He's yeah. trying to fight it. He's trying to fight it. <laughs> <laughs> and then the laughter and the mirror work. Good job, guy. Yeah, Good everyone job. else was just like, I'm going to take a nap. Now I'm a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that the one guy had that little bit where he's like sobbing before he then spits it. But yeah, most everyone else is just there. Yeah. Like, especially the initial woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, she has that bit where she's like creepily crawling up people, but she's still yeah. doing it all stone faced. I love that idea of fighting it, but it's still overcoming you. Yeah. I like the last woman, too, just because I like the idea that the devil has blonde ponytail. Well, and that's what I also <laughs> liked about her, was she's playing it like a perky little eight-year-old girl with a ponytail, and she's smiling and bobbing all mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. her what face, was her specialty? Her face work was good. I don't know what her specialty was. She was just, like, complaining. Yeah, she just complained <laughs> from minute right. one. Yeah. And again, that's where there's no characterization to any of this. Yeah. Even the main characters are not safe from that criticism. Like, I don't understand. The two main characters were written as if he just took the pages from the fog with that couple relationship and then just transferred it over here. They have the same arc. See, in the fog, right. I had a problem with the plot, but the characters were actually really compelling and developed. Yeah. This one I actually thought made a better use of the whole, we found this hidden text and it has this whole backstory that's now coming back to haunt us. I thought this was more effective than that. But John Carpenter has not had a produced screenplay that he's written since Halloween 2. Mm. I know there were like three or four years there where he just didn't write any. And this was his first script. And it feels like it's following Halloween 2 more than it is anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's more effectively directed than Halloween 2. But it has a lot of the same lackingness in the material. It has a lot of Jack Kirby's fourth world ideas put in a generic slasher, it seems like. You could take out that entire cosmic backstory and it wouldn't change the horror at all. You could take out the science and it wouldn't change the horror at all. Mm -hmm. It's an effective horror movie that just has these other things. That they're really neat, interesting concepts, but it just doesn't do anything with them. It's coasting on skill more than charm. Yeah. 
because mm. it really is well done. Like there's things that are so advanced that I was just like, whoa, that was in the 80s. Like when he speeds up the Asian woman who was translating the text when she lunges at the one guy. It was mm-hmm. done really skillfully, or they have the uh, stony face girl, the first girl who's turned, standing off center and kind of like a weird twist on the whole Michael Myers thing. She's just kind of mm-hmm. standing to the left of the hole. Beautiful stuff. And the ending shot, not the ending ending shot, but when the girl is like reaching back to the mirror as she's getting pulled into the dark dimension. Oh, so good. Yeah. That's a truly haunting shot. Mm -hmm. Yes. That is one of the best shots in the movie. And that's where I feel bad because my memory of Gary Kibbe's cinematography was that I didn't really like it much in terms of because now he's going to be Carpenter's cinematographer. Watching this movie in widescreen for the first time made me realize it's because I've only really seen any of the films he did with Carpenter in Pan and Scan VHS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's very different here. Yeah. For a first time DP, this film looks gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's a few bits where they they muted the color tones a little too much at times, where it's people in brown in front of brown backgrounds, Mm. and they could have maybe popped it a little more, but everything is so well composed, so well lit. Yeah, the Homeless Army was kind of a misfire, considering John Carpenter's shown such skill with that before, with like Assault in Precinct 13 of the Faceless Horde. What I like, though, is the army isn't there for Satan. They're there to keep it contained. Because remember, the bugs are warning them. Mm -hmm. The bug man is warning them, die now, you'll be better for it. He's trying to help them in his own odd way. They're (laughs) there to keep this place contained. Okay, I see. So I think they're actually responding to the signal from the future. That's my theory, at least. Okay. He could have shown that a little bit better because I guess they are killing them as they come out just in case maybe they're possessed or whatever. But I like how that's an inverse of Assault and Precinct 13 where they're always pouring in. Yeah. No, here they're just herded around, just keeping it tight. How freaky was that bug guy? Bug guy was pretty creepy. That was a good effect. Let's go ahead and talk about Alice Cooper. Yeah, let's talk about Alice Cooper. He kind of stands out. He kind of does. Which is kind of a misfire if you're going to have a faceless horde of homeless people to have a super famous rock star as one of their people. With a 10-yard stare. In caked white makeup that nobody else has. Yeah, and his magic bicycle. Which the disappointing (laughs) thing about the bicycle is that that guy never came back as a zombie just kind of walking forward on the bicycle. I know, right? Like, they're in the hallways, and you just hear the squeaky, 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 Mm -hmm. and he rounds the corner, leaning forward on this bicycle wheel. (laughs) It's like, if you're going to do that, do that. But it was literally just because they just filmed his stuff in a day. His touring act was in town. They had the bicycle rig. The whole crucified pigeon was also part of his act. But what it was, was there's the character of the bag lady who was the one who stabbed the guy and who was like nuzzling Donald Pleasant's hand. She was going to be more of the lead of the Mm -hmm. group. And they just gave a lot of her stuff to him. Mm. And she didn't really get too many great moments either. Like she was great in the beginning when she had like the ants on her face or when she was nuzzling Donald Pleasant's. But at one point she runs out, stabs the guy and then exit stage left. That was one of my problems Mm -hmm. was there's so much of this film. It's skillfully made as it is. There's so much of this film that I have seen before. There's a lot of it that's coming from our gender. I mean, that entire thing of the wide shot of someone suddenly runs in and stabs a person, that's taken straight from Deep Red. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot from Inferno, a lot from the beyond, a lot from the various Quater masses. Isn't the setup of Stone Tape is it's a whole bunch of college science kids go to this old place where the setup there is that they're trying to start their own recording industry and stumble into this whole supernatural thing that they're trying to figure out with science? Actually, I thought they were like doing processors for dishwashers or something like that. What I saw was they were trying to create a new form of recording thing in order to... Oh, that's right. What's the next version of tape so we can get a leg up on the industry and they end up then deciphering all these signals that are like recorded in the stones. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the whole way that the zombie thing is transferred from people is so much a more laid back version of the Deadites from Evil Dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It feels like he made a horror movie because he got an opportunity to make a movie and he just kind of threw something together. I mean, that's what happened with The Fog, was Halloween was a big hit, let me just throw some ideas together and we'll go out and make something. And that doesn't make it bad, it just, Carpenter's done so much deeper and more interesting material. There's something about this movie that just doesn't click with me, even though I don't dislike watching it. Well, if you're going to throw something together and do something quick, I mean, the cardinal rule is to go simple, and this is not simple. And yet it is. It's deceptively complex. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, though, it could use another edit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's 90% exposition. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, it could have been cleansed a little bit from the script side, consolidate some characters, 
boost the characterization a little bit more and then film it and give it a little bit more breathing room. Yeah. And this would be amazing. See, and that's the thing is the whole mystery of what's going on. They resolve all that in the first half of the movie. All yeah. of the backstory is uncovered in the first half. I mean, the whole conversation between Victor Wong and Donald Pleasance about what they're actually dealing with is literally the midpoint of the movie. Yeah, the first half is very intellectual and you're set up to believe that the rest of the movie is going to be like this. It's like, oh, this, I'm in for this ride because it's a horror movie with yeah. all of these interesting science trappings. And then it just gets dropped. And then it becomes, you know, mirror portals, zombies, and 20 minutes of Walter stuck in the closet. Yeah, and it becomes yeah. 10 little Indians. You know, you're just picking off characters one by one. But not even in an intriguing way that has anything to do with them as characters. It's just nope. their fodder. Nope. Yep. That's why there were so many people here, so they had enough to kill. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they come back, you can kill them again. Yeah. <laughs> I just love the one guy who gets his neck snapped for no reason and then comes back as a zombie instead of why didn't she just zombify him with the water spray like she does everyone else? Mm -hmm. Who I love is one of the cops on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Oh, oh, God, is that... Oh, I know exactly who that is now. He's yeah. the bald chubby guy? Yeah. He was also one of the cops in Starman of those two cops who went after them with the shotgun. Oh, That's crazy. It was an interesting cast. Diverse cast. That's what I liked. I like the diversity, too. Yeah, me too. But even yeah. then, they have to have comments about, we got a lot of women here, and here's our lead character making jokes about being sexist. That's true, yeah. we got a lot of Asian people here. Let's make Asian jokes. One step forward, two steps back. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love Victor Wong as basically Bernard Quatermass, but again, he didn't really get to do anything in the second half except just kind of run around with everyone. And I was getting really excited in the beginning, too. I'm like, wow, this is like a greatest hits. And like, yeah. that's two guys from Big Trouble in Little China yeah. and Donald Pleasance. I know, right? I mean, you would expect some of this would come from him and Donald Pleasance putting their heads together and figuring out something. Yeah. They don't. Donald Pleasance goes and hides in the boiler room, and Victor Wong pretends to move a couch with everyone else. Poor Donald Pleasance. It's just like, oh, hey, we need someone to get really bent out of shape about evil. Can you do that? <laughs> I love that John Carpenter doesn't even name that character. He's just the priest. <laughs> he's just the priest. He's never named in the movie. In the credits, he's the priest. In the script, he was just the priest. Because, you know, everybody's just going to call him Donald Pleasance. You know, why even bother? <laughs> right. It's true. I have him in my notes as Loomis. Yeah. I'm like, and Loomis did this. Yeah. In some of the early press <laughs> materials, they just called him Father Loomis. That's amazing. I'm on board for that. How great would it have been to have Donald Pleasance and Victor Wong in a Quatermass movie? Yeah, that would have been Guys, great. Guys, like, what the hell is this Quatermass stuff, man? What are you talking <laughs> okay, okay. about? That's right. You weren't here for Halloween 3. <laughs> <laughs> Help me out. <laughs> so the Quatermass series started in the 1950s. It was a series of BBC miniseries or kind of TV movies that were then made into Hammer movies. They were all written by Nigel Neal, and they had this very great scientific bent, but they also usually had this supernatural angle. So the most famous one is Quatermass in the Pit, which was, you know, remade as this Hammer film in 1967, if I remember yeah. right. It's like something is dug up during a construction in Britain, and it turns mm -hmm. out to be an ancient Martian spaceship. That then ties into the whole evolution of humans as a species and then becomes this whole big psychokinetic thriller as the Martian DNA within us all starts to come to life again. Mm -hmm. And Bernard Quatermass is this rocket scientist who then is this hero of these science adventures. They were very influential on X-Files. X-Files was very much influenced by Quatermass. Okay. Yeah. And Quatermass in the Pit, amazing movie. And if you like that, there are many more to watch. It's really fun stuff. Doctor Who would not exist without Quatermass. It was a huge influence on creating Doctor Who. You're welcome, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> we had Alex on the Halloween 3 where we covered that, and you weren't there, Julia. No, I don't know this Quatermass. <laughs> <laughs> go listen to the first 10 minutes of that episode. Or go listen to the episode of Xanadu Cinema Pleasure Dome. Which is damn near two hours long as we get drunker and drunker, and a well-known author explains Quatermass to us. It's pretty great. Yes, their <laughs> podcast involves alcohol. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that door is open, Noel. That door is open. <laughs> in terms of the lead couple, Catherine is almost more the lead character in the story in terms of the value she has, mm -hmm. in terms of the role she plays. But it's like, what's his name? Mustache guy keeps manning his way into thinking he's the lead. It's like, don't worry, honey, I got this. He's like charging in, not all men. <laughs> 
he's the blandest. I mean, he's supposed to be a college student. He looks like a 35-year-old accounts manager. Oh, none of these people look like college students. No, but even just the hair and the mustache and that polo shirt he has in the first scene. And his name is Brian Marsh. Yeah, I keep <laughs> wishing he was um, Tom Decker. <laughs> I mean, it would be fun if they played him like Jack Burton, thinking that he's the lead of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's that problem that keeps going all the time and no one can fix it. Like, it's like the Ant-Man effect where they're, everyone is like, well, why isn't Wasp doing anything? Well, yeah. because the man has to do something. <laughs> I mean, Catherine has that great hero moment at the end with that great tragic ending for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But even then, she didn't really do anything in the story up to then because she was just looking at the equations on a computer that never really lead anywhere. That's true. That never pays off. No, they, the equations on the computer was what made them figure out the fact that there was this double entity on the other side of the mirror to begin with because of the double mathematician problems. But again, all of that stuff could just be they just read it in the book. Not the double math equations. I don't think that's in the book. It's all biblical stuff in the book. No, but I mean just the backstory. But yeah. I didn't pay attention to any of this. <laughs> <laughs> the translation didn't come to naught except for like a big jump scare at the end. She's not even using the computer to translate anything. She's just very slowly transcribing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very slowly transcribing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really thought they maybe should have brought in someone else, even if it was just, you know, like an internship to maybe just do the typing for her or at the very least move the book to the other side of the table. Like her neck must have hurt. <laughs> like, I thought they were going to use some kind of like photo scanning equipment to like lift out what are the words that are written underneath the fresher words. Mm -hmm. But no, she's, she's just looking at the page. Oh, this was 1987. They didn't have that in 1987. <laughs> and by the way, that book did not look 2000 years old. No, no that was new. it did not. That looked like a recent print on recent printing paper. That was like a recent print of the Silmarillion. That's what it looked like. <laughs> I was hoping they'd glean some information from it to defeat the creature. I mean, it was so big, at least hit someone with it. Yeah, that's true. Just give us the secret of the ooze book. <laughs> That's what it looks like. It's the Dimension X ooze. It is true. Oh, uh, yeah, I suppose. And Krang is going to come out of Dimension X. With a blonde ponytail. And the giant red sculpted hand of basically darkness from Legend. I was going to yeah. say, yeah. When it was completely dark, I don't know if it was just my TV or whatnot, that looked really effective. But then when it became like red with like the claws and I was just like, oh, OK, we're going that route. It looked a little too on the nose. Because they were doing so many interesting things with the fact that the devil was being presented as this warped, they live cheerleader. Mm -hmm. But then they just went with big red hand. And then also you have in the video dreams... The figure is basically Slender Man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They just get a big skinny guy just kind of waving his arms around in the shadows. Yeah. I thought that was the priest. No, no, no. In the videos? Yeah, in the videos. I thought that was the priest. No, that's supposed to be anti-god. I yeah. thought it was the priest who ended up being the one who got his body taken over by the anti-god. But because they changed history, it ended up being the woman instead. And then the new history is the fact that they changed it over it and then it becomes the woman who sacrificed herself at the end. I like that. Here's the question. The final video where it's Catherine, is that a real video or is that just a dream that Brian is having because he's been exposed to the videos before? Well, we'll have to wait until one, nine, nine, nine to find out. <laughs> so did we find out 16 years ago? Yes. No. <laughs> Guys, you didn't see that? <laughs> it was Prince. <laughs> <laughs> and then the whole videos from the future were really interesting and really effectively done. But what did they really do? Nothing. They just look cool. What did they reveal that then moved the plot forward? What action did they enact? It was just another good idea. And I will say that I liked it. That was also ahead of its time, switching to like the video and sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it looked like something you'd see on YouTube. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like uh, signs where they show the video of the kids party and like the YouTube clip and then the alien walk. That was good. This is one of those films where it just feels like he didn't really sit down and think any of it through. And it didn't feel like he was interested in doing that. But he still made an effective movie out of it. So it's like it's weird to complain about it because it was still an effective experience. Mm -hmm. I just don't think there's anything more to it. It's a fun horror movie to throw on if you want to be creeped out for 90 minutes. But there's nothing more to it. There's nothing more to explore in it. The thing that gets me is that it could easily have been an amazing movie. Yes. Like, the pieces are there to make a really great horror movie. It just needed another pass of editing. Yeah, and that's where it reminds me a lot of The Fog. Yeah, although I like The Fog better. Uh, I like the characters. The Fog is almost the inverse. It has a weaker plot but better characters. This one has a more interesting plot but weaker characters. Mm -hmm. But they're both very effectively executed. 
But it's just hard to believe this is the same guy who wrote stuff like Someone's Watching Me, which is one of the most mm-hmm. intricately crafted screenplays I've ever seen. Or Assault on Precinct 13, or Halloween. Mm-hmm. <sighs> it's a frustrating movie, but I still don't dislike it. No. I'm going to go with a soft no on my end <laughs> after <laughs> hashing it out. Soft no, soft no. That's still three recommends. I think the film, you know, it's still mm-hmm. got something there. I'm changing mine to a strong recommend, guys. Strong recommend? <laughs> Just to balance this out. Yeah, I think... Soft I, no, strong recommend. I think I really dig it. I think it's got layers, guys. <laughs> I think we got onion this thing. We got a rewatch in different moods yeah. with different kinds of alcohol. Yeah. And I really mm-hmm. think that's going to bring it together. All right. It's a slow burn. <laughs> this is one of those movies that is best served at about 2 a.m. when it's kind of dark. Yeah. You got friends around... And you've maybe had a couple beers and you're in a good mood. It's one of those on cable at 1 a.m. type movies. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's got Parents Basement written all over it. It does. I'm telling you. (laughs) The reviews are like mixed, too. It's like 50-something percent. Oh, it was torn apart when it came out. Oh, yeah? But, you know, Carpenter's still happy with it. He still says he, he enjoys it. One of the other things was the score by Alan Howarth keeps falling in line with all the other Alan Howarth ones we've run into where it's effectively moody, mm. but it's so unmemorable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really? I had that thing stuck in my head all night. Like I had it in my sleep. Well, what part? All like I remember is dun, 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 dun. Yeah. yeah, that part that just kept going over and over in my head. You know, the song he wrote. <laughs> Which is a very generic horror soundscape. You weren't sleeping, dreaming of one, nine, nine, <laughs> nine. I was dreaming of like burnt faces. <laughs> <laughs> burnt devil faces. <laughs> skitty, skitty. And that was just interesting, the whole stages of her possession where she gets the whole bruise branding her on the arm. The bruise, by the way, has the logo of the Blue Oyster Cult. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, it is the Blue Oyster Cult logo. I would not be surprised <laughs> if Carpenter did that as a deliberate reference. They seem like his type of music. Well, I mean, it's an older symbol. It's the symbol for lead or something like that. Okay. It has other meanings through history. But when I saw it, it's like, Blue Oyster Cult. All right. Don't fear the Reaper, guys. See, now finding out that that's the symbol for lead could have led to a very big scientific resolution in terms of let's lead this bastard up. <laughs> I could have done the editing on this. This would have been awesome <laughs> you know, if, I, if I, as a 13-year-old, had gotten my hands on it. <laughs> There are so many films I've said that about. (laughs) I think the biggest was like a year ago where I'm like, you know what? I could see a 90 minute cut of Thin Red Line. Let me work this out. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, oh, oh. (laughs) He did Days of Heaven in 90 minutes. He could do Thin Red Line in that too. Uh, You might be right on that. Anyways, but I mean, with the Alan Howard scores, there was actually an interesting bit on a documentary. They had an interview with Alan Howard on the DVD where he revealed a bit about how they would actually work was where Carpenter would do a full cut of the movie and then in one session would just play the movie and live at a keyboard would just make up the score as he's going along, just plunk out some notes here and there. And then he would just hand that to Alan Howard and Alan Howard would go over and add things to that. Hmm. John Carpenter would spend an hour and a half doing the score. And then Alan Howarth would take that and then spend weeks doing the final thing. (laughs) And I think that kind of shows because Carpenter is no longer coming up with the melodies that he had in the 70s. Mm -hmm. It's an effective score while playing in the scenes, but there's nothing more to it than just atmosphere. Yeah, it is just an atmospheric score. But just rewatching the film tonight, the score was very effective, particularly like in the opening scenes. Mm -hmm. I love the opening scenes and how those are set up. And how that's cut in with the credits. Yeah. Yeah, it's cut in with the credits. And I love the people meeting each other, but you never hear what they're talking about. You just see them and their reactions to each other. That stuff worked great. I love it when he does that, because that was how the opening to the thing was done, too. True. Here's a couple of shots with no context, black. Mm -hmm. Some shots with no context, black. And gradually the scene is building as Mm -hmm. these pieces are coming together. That's great Carpenter filmmaking. Mm -hmm. It's just Prince of Darkness for me is we are already sloping down from the peak. Oh, yeah. The peak was The Thing, Starman, Big Trouble in Little China. And we're not going to have that anymore. It feels like he's half-assing the scripts. He's no longer doing the scores on his own. He's having other people do that. Most of his team is gone. Deborah Hill is gone. Larry Franco is only going to do a couple more films and then he's gone. His cinematographer is gone. Tommy Lee Wallace, who was his production designer and editor, he's gone. This entire support structure that he had is gone and he feels like he's kind of burned out. Yeah, he did this film because he was burned out working with the studios. Studios were burned out working with him. Mm -hmm. And this film feels like a 
I just want to go and get a film out of my system type of thing. You know, and for that, it's still actually surprisingly watchable and effective. Well, yeah. And he also has, you know, a few peaks after this. I mean, because They Live is coming up and I love They Live. I have memories about They Live. We'll see how they live. Up. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> and I'm a big fan of In the Mouth of Madness. Yeah, I loved that in the 90s. I haven't seen it in a million yeah. years, but I remember loving that movie. But I will say, you know, a Gary Kibbe cinematography was a lot better than I remembered it being. So maybe I'll still be surprised by some of these other ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it still has that feel. It still has a lot of that feel to me. Yeah, because I mean, In the Mouth of Madness, I haven't seen in a long time. They Live, I've only ever seen on VHS, Pan and Scan. Escape from L.A. and Vampires, I've only ever seen on VHS, Pan and Scan. So it's like I've never really seen the actual movies themselves. I've just seen the chopped up VHS versions. You've only seen like two thirds of the movies. Exactly, because Carpenter is always the very (laughs) wide, wide, two, three, five widescreen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just watching the cinematography here on the videotape, it was all just square Mm close-ups. Here, it's that great Carpenter negative space. Everything is just so beautifully composed. Like, I even love that shot of Walter escaping from the closet just as they're bursting in through the door. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's like that whole train. That and when the guy, uh, Mustache Man, jumps down into the alley, I'm not even sure why he did it, and then climbs up, (laughs) that was really genuinely effective. I think that was Mm -hmm. just so no one in the audience would say, why don't they try to jump out? Yeah. I'm sure that is exactly why that scene exists. (laughs) There seems to be a bunch of tacked on scenes as well, like additional kill scenes in the spirit of the fog and Halloween 2. Well, I did read the screenplay, and for the most part, it's all here. There wasn't really anything from the script that was cut. But the bug man wasn't in the script. The guy slitting his own throat and then having the whole mirror stuff, that wasn't in the script. The bicycle wasn't in the script. He just got stabbed. So it's like a lot of little moments weren't there, like him jumping out and then jumping back in. That wasn't in the script. So they did make up a lot of stuff on set. And even hearing on the commentary, that actor, Peter Jason, was talking about how Carpenter was a very open filmmaker on this movie. He let the actors add a lot of things, improv a lot, because the characterizations were completely absent on the script. And there were some nice things that the actors brought in. Was the dinner of Apple's double stuffed Oreos, was that in the script? No. Oh, man. (laughs) Peter Jason bouncing the apple off of his arm while playing a nose trumpet, that wasn't in the script. That was a great scene. (laughs) That's pretty awesome. (laughs) I was I was rather impressed by that. I was just like, that guy knows how to party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coffee, apples, and double stuff Oreos. That is the dinner of champions. Well, they did have pizza there, too. <laughs> I can imagine someone being bored enough, let's just chop all that, put it on the pizza. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens in college. They didn't do that, therefore not college students. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of them are studying their doctorates and their masters. Yeah. yeah. That's where I like the line where he says, you're all basically full scientists, you just don't have the degrees yet. Mm-hmm. And then I love that backstory where the priest and Barack know each other because they both participated in a series of televised debates about science versus religion. Mm-hmm. And I like how that ended up building to them being kind of friends. And then one will go to the other for help. It's true. I want to know in the past how they've gone to each other for help. Well, maybe they're like drinking buddies that meet up every now and then, you know? Well, yeah. But also like, oh, my car's carburetor is broken. Do you know anything <laughs> about carburetors? I want to see the TV show leading up to this. And it's just these two being friends. And there's like the situation of the week. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm having a crisis of conscience that I can't philosophically decide on. <laughs> or Victor Huang is, has a crush on a, another teacher at school, but, you know, she doesn't know he exists. And he goes to the priest for advice. And then there's going to be the Schrodinger's cat episode. Yes. <laughs> Which was an interesting, weird perversion of the Schrodinger's cat theory that they're relating to here of technically it's only when you open the box that he metamorphosizes into whichever form he's in. It's like, no, it's just about theoretics. It's just hypothetically he could be one or the other and you have to accept that he's possibly both. Well, the waveform collapses. I mean, that's the way you technically describe it. I mean, Schrodinger's cat does actually work in reality on a quantum level. I mean, if you look at the Bose-Einstein condensate, if you slow down a particle so it's not moving anymore, its position becomes uncertain. Okay. Because you know its speed. That is literally what happens on the quantum level. And it's ridiculous. Now, the Schrodinger's cat theory, well, theory, but not a theory, it's a uh, illustration, was come up by Schrodinger because he was declaring it bullshit. And (laughs) so he came up with the cat to illustrate, this is why I think this is ridiculous. But the thing is, on the quantum level, that is how it works. Okay. Those two waveforms coexist. And when one becomes certain, the other one does not. And they constantly balance each other out. 
the very act of observing one alters the outcome of the other is, I think, how it boils down. I mean, if you put in energy to observe what the speed of a particle is, you throw off the position and vice versa. In other words, the anti-god. Therefore, anti-god. <laughs> There's my science. Boom. <laughs> Drop that right there like a microphone. And I just love the whole thing of Jesus's entire purpose was to come down here to warn us about this. But then he did all this other stuff, too, and they killed him for it. <laughs> And then he became a great leader and they were afraid of him. It's like, but if he was just coming down here to warn us about something, I don't know, maybe it's like he came down and was like, hey, this is a pretty cushy opportunity. I don't know. It's a weird theory about Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we're really no strangers to weird theories about Jesus here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's no weirder than a lot of them. And what's interesting is in the Carpenter audio commentary, he's like, a lot of this came from he was doing a lot of genuine philosophical pondering at the time. And so he is starting to pour out things that he was actually thinking about at the time, like theoretically himself. Hmm. He must have been really high. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Village of the Damned. No, yeah, my <laughs> God. Oh, God. Space Jesus is a product of marijuana, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's even admitted in interviews that he does, so. Oh, I, I know, I know. <laughs> oh, John. At least now he has valid medical reasons for it. Yes. Although I would not recommend anybody getting valid medical reasons just to get marijuana. No. <laughs> I love how in the interview on the DVD, he literally just says, Ah, uh, yeah, I've been thinking about this movie a lot, because all I do these days is just sit around, watch basketball, and play video games. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's all he does. Which is sad. I don't know, but every year I see with him, he's very content. Well, okay. Well, if he's happy, then that's cool. Mm -hmm. He's happy to end on the ward. <laughs> uh, I mean, he's old enough. I mean, I suppose, yeah. you know, retirement is acceptable. Yes. <laughs> I didn't like it that every time someone left the room, my immediate thought was, well, I'm going to die, because that's exactly what happened. <laughs> so they did kind of teleplay the deaths a little bit. Yeah, I love how it's like they split up, can't find anyone. So they get back together to say, we can't find anyone. So they split up more. Yeah. And then they come back and fewer of them are there to say, we can't find anyone. And then they split up more. No one really misses anyone, though. No one coordinates. No yeah. one coordinates in this movie. <laughs> People are just like, oh, I just saw what's her name over there. She was just standing there with a stone face. Eh, whatever. And they're like, where is she? Are you lying to me? It's like, there's a corner there. She probably walked around the corner. Yeah. Now I'm going to have a nap and die. <laughs> that was another thing that never really explained was when he then went down into the chamber and she broke his neck, he finds this piece of machinery that's beeping and it starts beeping louder as she gets closer to it. They never say what that's detecting or how that's reading anything off of her. The scariness. Demon detector. <laughs> and then I love how in all the time that everyone is in that room, nobody notices the giant puddle on the ceiling until her. It's a very quiet puddle. Because that's been accumulating there for a while, given how slowly that's been dripping. Well, would you expect a puddle to be on the ceiling? No, but you would hear water. <laughs> Just in your line of sight, you would see a giant wobbling green form at the top of your eye line. That's true. Reflecting the light at least. <laughs> Especially when you're looking up at a vial. True. <laughs> yeah. And what was that about someone said about the lock opens from the inside? That doesn't right. seem like a good idea. Yeah, that's weird that it's supposed to contain the devil, but the devil is the only one who can open the thing that's containing him. Yeah, what is with that? Maybe he has agoraphobia. What? <laughs> what if it could only be opened in the reflection of a mirror or something? I don't know. Maybe. I think we're giving the movie too many yeah. <laughs> rules that it doesn't need. Oh, that was funny. For some of the mirror effects... The way they achieved that was they quietly, and they didn't tell the studio that they were going to do this, but they took the crane that was used to shoot the movie and drained the mercury out of it to create a <laughs> pool of mercury to reach in and out of. And then they quietly poured that back into the crane. That's very toxic, guys. <laughs> yeah. And they are literally like putting fingers and hands through it. That's not good. Yeah. That's really unhealthy. I know. And Carpenter, even on the commentary, is like, don't tell anyone I did this, kids. Uh, I'm canceling the podcast due to recklessness. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that, that, no, that's bad. <sighs> I know. Bad. Well, that's also partially why they had the big red hand be a fake hand, because that's coming up out of the Mercury. <sighs> this is why CGI was invented, this movie. And that's why you'll notice that when her damaged arm is going in, it is an actor's arm, but it's much more padded up than it was usually. Oh, wow. It's like got all rubber underneath <laughs> of it. I'd hope so. Oh, I thought it just looked like that because she regenerated it. 
Oh, yeah, that's true. She did. They chopped her arm off and then it came back. That was actually a nice effect of the new arm shooting out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Little nod to the thing. And that's what I liked is that Donald Pleasance still got to do stuff in the third act. Yeah. He fretted a lot. Donald Pleasance with an axe. Yeah. I'm always on board for Donald Pleasance with an axe. Seriously, <laughs> guys. But yeah, it's just Victor Wong. Then just they didn't do anything with Victor Wong. And then I love the, a lot of bits where it's like they just let him improvise for a while. And he's not a very good improviser because he's like, hey, guys, how are you guys doing? Did you see the guys out there? What you doing, guys? <laughs> you okay, guys? <laughs> Not all actors can improvise. No. Let that be a lesson. It's true. I liked uh, when Walter got out. I was really hoping he would just run. Just keep yeah. running. I'm like, just get the fuck out of there. I like how he gets out, goes, gets the cops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was hoping he would just never come back. You have to wonder what they told the cops. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do like how the basement church was like one set of billowing curtains away from Meatloaf's I'll Do Anything for Love video. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> Which, by the way, was directed by Michael Bay. And really? I kind of now want to see what Prince of Darkness would be if it was directed by Michael Bay. The same, except the camera would just be spinning around everybody. It would have Meatloaf starring in it instead of a guy who looks like Meatloaf. That's probably true. Given that John Carpenter is now appearing in a ton of music videos these days. Have you seen that one, Melissa, where he just had a music video starring him done for his new album? No. Ooh. Oh. It's for the track Night. Just look at John Carpenter Night on YouTube. Okay. And then he has this other band that brought him in to do a narration similar to what he did in this movie over this claymation tribute video to like all of the 80s. They're called Gunship. Gunship. Yeah. Okay. There's a whole wave of music artists these days that are inspired by John Carpenter's scores. And because of his album, they're now like, hey, you want to come and just be in our video or something? And I think a lot of that's also his son's friend, because his son is a musician who will actually be doing scores for later Carpenter works. Like, he did the scores for the Masters of Horror. Interesting. Any final thoughts on Prince of Darkness? I'm still, I enjoy it. It's effective, but there's not much to it. It's the least amount of notes I've ever written in my time as a podcaster. <laughs> exposition, exposition. Oh, that was creepy. Exposition, exposition. <laughs> it's usually just writing what people say just out of incredulousness. <laughs> I wrote down, what does it say? How married, proud <laughs> sexist, <laughs> yeah. <and> sexual panic. <laughs> yeah. The proud sexist thing is like, yeah, she would have walked. <laughs> <laughs> Deal with it, is basically his attitude. <laughs> yeah, great. And she's like, cool, what's up with this guy? I should sleep with him. And that was actually one thing that I liked. The homosexual panic line was a little weird, but I liked how they treated Walter's sexuality as it's so not a thing, mm -hmm. which you would usually not get in the 80s. They would either make it a big joke or it just wouldn't be there. I love that whole line of like, I had a great date lined up with this trial attorney. And Brian just says, well, how would you manage to nab a guy like him? And that's it. That's the <laughs> only reference you get to it. It just paints his character who's not played stereotypically at all. He's not a very likable character, but he's just played as a general asshole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. It's an interesting touch that we've noticed this where Carpenter is oddly sensitive to representation in his movies. Mm -hmm. And then he'll do something crazy. Yeah, I, I do like how, I mean, with this cast, I mean, a lot of times, especially in the 80s, what you saw was like the variety pack cast where yeah. you have one woman, you got a token black guy, you might get an Asian guy, and then a bunch of white dudes. Yeah. And this is, you know, several women, you know, varying ethnicities. You've got the gay Asian guy, you have people of various ages. You had three Asians. Yeah. Three Asians in one group. Yeah. And multiple black people. And yeah, it's actual diversity. Yeah. Someone's watching me. We, we covered this. Alex and Julia had a homosexual character as a best friend, and it was played very intelligently and very respectfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Big Trouble in Little China. We got to how it played with ethnicity and Asian culture in a very interesting and surprisingly thoughtful way. Carpenter is very sensitive, which for the 80s is so weird. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we covered that with the weird homoerotic aspects of Starman that would pop up every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, any final thoughts? My favorite scene in the movie was when um, the priest was giving the guy the last rites upstairs in, I think they were in a kitchen or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's in. He actually can't finish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's when I started to get really scared. I don't know, man. It came together a lot more for me, and I found it a lot scarier. I think it's because it combines two things that I find really scary anyways, which is religious stuff 
raised Roman Catholic guys, there's a lot of stuff back there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Religious stuff combined with sort of like, I am really scared of stuff that's like about nothingness. So a lot of times it's space mm-hmm. that gets me really scared. But in this, it was kind of the idea of the antimatter and the fact of like the imbalance of it and that there was this whole other black place. And I really liked that this is a priest combined with these scientists and that through science and, you know, a jar of goo, they managed to prove (laughs) that not only does God exist, but anti-God exists. And anti-God is really angry and your God isn't going to help you. (laughs) And like he's standing there like praying out of the Bible, asking Jesus for help. And he also knows, I think in that moment when he's giving the last rites, that he's not going to help him, Mm. that his God is not going to help him. And it's up to them to save themselves, which in itself is terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) So I just found the whole idea of the science and the, the religious stuff actually blended a lot more than you guys were saying. And I actually was really scared by the idea of, I know it's very sort of hokey when he came out of the mirror with the glove and everything, but I was genuinely like really scared of just the idea of darkness itself. Which reaching is, into yeah, nothing. Yeah, reaching into nothingness. And especially that shot, which Something you guys reaching all back. really liked, was like her going to the other side of the mirror and it just being nothingness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was good. Which is just like super scary. Yeah. I'm not saying it's like the best, but I don't watch a lot of horror movies. I was going to say, what you're really <laughs> saying is... Is you like Event Horizon and I don't. That is true. <laughs> Event Horizon. I love Event Horizon. Big fan, guys. Big fan. <laughs> when he's holding his eyeballs, come on. Do you see? <laughs> he's holding them for the audience. <laughs> and it works. <laughs> well, I will say for the first time I watched this, I had very much the same reaction, even though I was raised atheist. Rather, I was raised apatheist, I should say. I was raised with no religion whatsoever. And so coming to stuff like Prince of Darkness or any sort of film that is rooted in uh, religion, it's like, eh, it definitely doesn't have the same impact on me as it does on a lot of other people. But even then, Prince of Darkness, the first time I watch it, did freak my shit out a bit. And what I loved about the Victor Wong character was he's never there to deny God. Yeah. He's like, okay, God exists. Let's figure out how. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out what this means about how he exists and then how this other force exists. Well, there's something also very Lovecraftian about the way they treat God and anti-God in this movie, Mm -hmm. because the central tenet of Lovecraft's mythos is that, yeah, these beings greater than us definitely exist, and they don't give one hoot about us. I mean, we are ants to them, and we just happen to be here, and if they notice us, it might be very bad. That's not a good thing. (laughs) Yeah. And so I feel like there's that same attitude here and Donald Pleasance realizing that in that scene that we may pray to the God, but the God is probably not hearing us at all. Yeah. It's a very powerful statement. I mean, that's what I love is that in the big final climax, he's making the sign of the cross and everything. That's having no effect. So he's like, okay, I have an ax. Let me just go try that. Yeah. (laughs) And I'm all for Donald Pleasance with an axe, as we've said before. Yeah, and that it ultimately comes down to not the power of prayer, but this one woman making this horrible sacrifice, and then him shattering the mirrors and no one can come back. Mm -hmm. Julia, I actually do agree with you on a lot of that stuff. I love how the science was used to uncover the story and unfold the story and figure out how it all worked. I just wish they could have carried that on throughout the film more. But still, even just setting that aside, the whole horror of the third act was very effectively done. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I didn't really see them as zombies. I saw them as like meat puppets. They were possessed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that he was basically able to see through their eyes and control them to do whatever he wanted them to do. Right. Oh, yeah. I was just using zombie as a general term. But yeah, no, they were more. They are there. But there is something else there that is forcing its way through them. Yeah. And I like how you can see when they're gone. Because some of them fight it, mm. and you can see that they're fighting it, and then some of them are just like, nope, they're, they're totally gone. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And I liked the girl, the main girl. I thought she was really scary. And when she crawled up onto the cot, that was scary, mm. guys. It was very scary. <laughs> well, she, was a, she was just one where I wish that they had given her a little character beforehand, but no, once she became the main force through which this is coming through, she was very creepy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually I didn't mind the fact that she didn't have a character. I mean, so many of them didn't. But, like, she didn't have a character because you didn't know what was normal for her. Mm -hmm. You didn't know whether she was, you know, like a quiet, observant type of person, Mm -hmm. whether her hanging out at the bottom of the hallway and not responding to your questions would be that weird. Yeah. 
yeah. <laughs> yeah no, and then like the woman that she's crawling up, that woman is just like, they're like, uh, yeah. what's going on here? Are <laughs> my misreading signals? <laughs> Are we going to kiss? Yeah. It's not like she's terrified. It's not like she's fighting. It's just, she's just like, what's yeah. happening? <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> and the fact that she's not as scared as you are watching it makes it extra scary. Yes. Yeah. Because we have already seen her snap someone's neck. Yeah. Yeah. It's mm. going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Something bad. No, yeah. That stuff, again, it is a very effective move. Maybe I'm a soft recommend. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh... I'm on the fence. I'm on the fence. <laughs> a maybe. A firm maybe. How's that? A firm maybe. <laughs> I'm very Prince of Darkness about this. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're constantly torn between the god and the anti-god. That's true. You are the pane of glass in the mirror. <laughs> <sighs> to live an anti-life. You're Schrodinger's critic. <laughs> So anything else you want to add or do we want to wrap up? I got to go pick up my kid. So I'm going to wrap this up. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Melissa. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure discussing films with you. Yay. Thank you for coming, Melissa. It was very nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys. And we will have you back next month for They Live. Yay. Oh, so excited. I am so looking forward to because it it's been so long since I've seen it. I have such conflicted memories and I'm curious to see what it lives up to. I remember it being awesome. We'll see. Uh, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Shocker. <sighs> I look forward to watching Roddy Roddy Piper again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it about zombies or? Uh, you'll see. Okay. I think you should go in fresh. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. I think it'll be fun for you. It is a fun movie. It is a fun, fun movie. I am looking forward to the commentary with Carpenter and Roddy Piper. Oh, did they do it together? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God, I need to listen to that. Thank you for listening to another episode of Masters of Carpentry. We will be back next time with They Live. Good night, everybody. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. <laughs> I'm a little tired tonight. Yeah, she's a little under the weather. I got my pajamas on and a robe and a sweater. <laughs> Let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> are they the pajamas of darkness? They are incredibly dark. <laughs> they have a jug head all over them. And there's another pair of pajamas on the other side of the mirror waiting for me. That's that are true. even darker. <laughs> well, given that Jughead is the all consuming son of the anti god. That's right. It's true. Have you been cleansed of strawberry soda? I have been cleansed and so has my carpeting. <laughs> it was rather spectacular. It was like, I hit record and I said, oh, I should get something to drink. And I went, I grabbed something to drink and it went poof. And so it's all, yeah. And now I'm just warily eyeing the carbonated soda that's sitting here unopened that I had grabbed for myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as you didn't shake it up, you should be fine. Yeah, I just bought it from the store, so it's been shaking around in a bag. Mm. Open it slow. Give it the hiss. I would let it sit for a moment. Take my words of wisdom, Noel. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know about the strawberry soda. Sorry. It is a Jones cane sugar soda. Jones! Yeah, it is a <laughs> strawberry lime soda. So it's got Ooh. a little bit of that tank. We do have that. Do we have that? We have that. Oh, I haven't seen Ooh. that. Sounds very good. America. Yes. It is good. It is good. They're up in the uh, Canadian lands. That's right. Ooh. Our snack game is not as strong as it's yours. It's not, no. Although you guys can get Kinder Eggs. Yes, we do get We're, Kinder Eggs. Well, our children are mature enough to handle Kinder Eggs. Well, you guys keep yeah. eating them whole. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> what are Kinder Eggs? Oh, oh no. <laughs> okay, so Kinder Eggs are these chocolate things. They're chocolate eggs, but they're hollow inside. And there's a toy inside. So it's like Cracker Ooh. Jacks, only with chocolate. They were banned in the U.S. because there was fear that children would choke on the toys and think the toy was a candy or something. So you eat the candy and whatever you hawk up, you get to keep. That's right. Pretty much. And, you know, they're pretty much legal everywhere else. It's just the U.S., our children can't handle them for some reason. I can picture a movie version of that that's like a combination of small soldiers and Attack on Titan. That's kind of awesome. <laughs> All from the toy's point of view. <laughs> <laughs>
And Kinder Egg Chocolate is the best. It's pretty great because it's a combination of milk and white chocolate. That's right. Mm -hmm. It is. It is good. I have had Polish knockoff Kinder Eggs. And for some reason, they could get (laughs) those inside the U.S. Or at least I could buy them inside the U.S. (laughs) I don't know if they were necessarily legal. They have a whole bunch of off-brand Kinder Eggs here. They have like frozen Kinder Eggs. My daughter is obsessed with Spider-Man Kinder Eggs. Okay, so frozen Kinder Eggs as in the frozen property from Disney or frozen as in you get them from your freezer? The former, although the latter now sounds pretty awesome. I know, right? We need to write a letter. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm just imagining a Spider-Man Kinder Egg knockoff where it's just an egg full of spiders. That's exactly what it was. (laughs) (laughs) She loves it. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> the black widows are the rarest yeah it's terrifying but if it makes her happy <laughs> don't nest in your room grow your own enjoy the chocolate <laughs> yeah so okay anyway i this is not a podcast about cool as ice although if you do one i'll be on it <laughs> <laughs> we'll see I'll, I'll note that for the future awesome <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a po- we'll do an entire series of podcasts about the films of Vanilla Ice, and it'll be like one episode and done. Well, that and Ninja Turtles Two: The Secret of the Use. Oh, that's right. <sighs> <laughs> See, and then enthusiasm deflates. <laughs> God damn it! I'd have to. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>